G'day. It's been a while since I've stood in front of the camera to be with you all as presenting the service for the day, but it is wonderful to share the Word of God. And so with that, let's begin. This week uh, we're going to look at the book of Luke, a particular part, a very small section. So before we have our introduction and, and our prayer, let me read to you a couple of verses. It says in chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke, verse 15, Now as the people were in expectation, and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one and mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Can you imagine the expectation that the people were feeling right then? That era of Israel's history was an era where there were a lot of people, particularly the people who studied their scriptures, who listened to the teachings of God's word, who were waiting for the Messiah. They were there eagerly waiting, not passively waiting, not waiting as something that was insignificant, hopefully it would happen, but eagerly anticipating what was coming. Their nation was subjugated. While they had a, a particular amount of freedom, it still does not bode well when a nation that was accustomed to its freedom was under somebody else's rule. But when we look at their history, we can see just why they were waiting and why they didn't like the rulership of the Romans. You see, Israel's history, since they came out of Egypt, had been on and off, on and off, on and off, in and out of God, in and out of God, being, listening to his teachings, following his teachings, and then going a different way and living like the rest of the world. And that was an issue for Israel. The Lord sent his prophets to say, come back. They listened and then they forgot. They became distracted again. And then they embraced God's word again. But before we get critical, we've got to remember that this also provides us with a caricature of ourselves. While that's a very real history that happened, it also reveals a lot about our own hearts. And the environment that Israel had been in, they had finally understood the message. And when they came out of Babylon, they'd been in captivity for quite some time, and they came out of Babylon as had been prophesied, and they were excited. They fell again, but this time they got up and they were determined never to fall again. You see, they made a commitment, and this time they were determined to keep it. But sometimes we follow a little bit too strongly our own inclinations. So we become like a pendulum in the various extremes when all we need to do is be pointing upwards. With that in mind, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you and learn your word. Lord, we want to know you and we realize that we are in an era now that was prophesied. But Lord, what we desire from you is your Holy Spirit to take charge, teach us, lead us and guide us in your word. So we submit this to you. Prepare us for the time at hand. But Lord, may we be found faithful. In Jesus name. Amen. Now, as you see from the experience that we've just read and talked about just a little bit. It, all of Israel was so eager in anticipation for the Messiah. The part that we are going to read now and, and go through step by step actually comes from just before the text that we read. And so as we go into the word, we're going to start from verse 7 of chapter 3 of the Gospel of Luke. 
So Luke chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and said to them, He who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. And he who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, And what shall we do? So he said to them, Do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and be content with your wages. Now this is a very interesting, interesting statement. And this is a very interesting thing that he should isolate. Let's go through it step by step. You can imagine him preaching and the fire and brimstone that they heard, and somehow they were drawn to him. The multitudes came out. They were looking for the Messiah. They listened to him, but John was preparing the way for the Messiah. It says in verse 3, And he went into all the region around Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book and the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John's purpose was to prepare for the Messiah. John's whole ministry was to get ready for Emmanuel. God with us. The presence of God amongst them physically. So you can understand why they were excited. But this sermon, we only get just a few lines, but it's still amazing. Let's have a look at this, the context. We, we've shared, everybody's come together, and there's just a buzz. And these people who are visiting, let's look at these. In verse 7, it says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers. All right, who are these multitudes? Well, clearly, they're made up of a number of people, including tax collectors and soldiers. They're the ones that are identified here. Luke doesn't make it clear who these individuals are at this stage. He does refer to them later on, but we know because of the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 7, tells us, who they are. So if you go into your Bible and look at Gospel of Matthew chapter 3, let me get there, and we're going to read verse 7. Okay, chapter 3 verse 7 says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Sound familiar? Well, these multitudes included the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why did they come? Well, very often in the Gospels we see that they've come to argue. But yet we're not being given that picture here because just a few verses down, in verse 10, it says, What shall we do then? So they were asking a question that is very personal. Well, what shall we do? We're brood of vipers. You're saying that we're, that we're feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit upon us that we have something in us that's not right. And they want to be baptized. Again, verse 7, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized, that's why they're there. They had something, a hungering and thirsting in their hearts that they needed to be satisfied. 
they were in anticipation of the Messiah. And then they heard the preaching of John, convicted to be baptized. As we read in verse 3, that the baptism was of repentance and for the remission of sin. Now, what is this repentance and remission of sin so on? Now, often you've probably heard it from me and many other preachers that repentance literally means to turn around. So I'm facing in the direction of the enemy. I'm following his pathway and his actions, the things that are born of rebellion, of selfishness, of pride. And then I repent. I turn away from the selfishness, the pride, the path of the enemy. I turn away from my rebellion. A change of loyalties, if you will. Loyal to myself, which in reality is in service to the enemy, or loyal to the Lord, which is a life of selflessness. Now, what about remission? Remission is a beautiful word. In this case, we see that it's for the removal of sin. You see, in the Gospels, we, we are inheriting so much more than just four little books. We've got the whole scripture for what we would refer to as the Old Testament. That, that's the majority of it. We have that heritage where we see at the beginning that something horrible happened in humanity. And that sin became part of humanity. And we see in human nature the selfishness, the greed, the pride that causes so much distress around the earth. And we know in our own lives that this selfishness, this greed, this pride has caused a lot of pain for even ourselves. And so we very definitely need the Messiah, the one who will come and take away our sins. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now there are two key aspects in there. Remission of sin and repentance. For my sin to be removed, don't I need to turn my back on it? So if I come to the Lord and say, I accept your gift of salvation, but I'm going to keep being proud. I'm going to keep being greedy and I am going to keep on with my pride because I'm better than everybody else. Have I really repented? Of course not. Not at all. So my sin will not be removed if I am still clinging to it. My fallen human nature is still the thing that I am following if I'm walking in that pathway. But if I choose to follow the Lord's way and loyalty to Him, it will also show in the way I interact with others. So we find this multitude included at the very least the scribes and the Pharisees. Now, who were the fly? Uh, sorry, flies. Who were the scribes and Pharisees? Well, they were the ones who studied the Word of God. Particularly the Pharisees. They had a great love for the Word of God, but they were so zealous, in fact, that they had left the Word of God and started to follow their own traditions. And these traditions were such that, well, God said this, but just in case. I might break this law, this word, or this teaching from God. I'm going to put in some, some safeguards just so I can make sure that I don't break it or, or for that matter, anybody else. And the Sadducees were a bit different. They decided to come from the perspective of, yeah, we love the Lord. We love, love God and what he has promised to give us. But you know all those things that happened there back then? They're just allegory, stories. So when we talk about things like resurrection, no, that's not what he's really talking about. God doesn't mean what he says he means. So they're reinterpreting, which ultimately, at the end of the day, it meant both parties were in a very difficult position. 
So let's see how this interacts with us a little bit later. Let's continue. John is preaching and he says to both of them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It's not very nice, is it? I have a feeling that their feelings may have been hurt. Brood of vipers. Imagine one Sabbath morning I come and I say to you, you venomous people, you spit poison out of your mouths. I have a feeling that I wouldn't quite be welcomed as readily to speak before you as I had been previously. But yet the Holy Spirit was on this man and even amongst the people because they said, tell us what to do. It's kind of interesting. He says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? But it's not a condemning statement that pushes them away. In fact, we see that in the very word that comes next in verse 8. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and then he knows their hearts he knows their culture and he knows their pride and so he adds this do not say or do not begin to say rather do not begin to say to yourselves we have abraham as our father for i say to you that god is able to raise up children to abraham from even these stones He's laying it on thick, isn't he? But what was so special about being Abraham's seed? See, this was the go-to phrase. Whenever trouble was coming on and, and something was wrong, then they say, well, you, you know, we probably better fix up our, our ways. Say, no, 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 we're Abraham's seed. God gave us this promise. This belongs to us and us alone. And we've got this heritage. No one will take it from us. And if they try, they better know what's best for them because we'll come to tell them. And indeed, that era was filled with so many, as I mentioned earlier, Messiah hopefuls that they took up the sword. They created skirmishes amongst the, the enemies as they saw them. Whether it was against Romans or the local authorities that they did not recognize as being Jewish or Israelite in heritage. They said, we are Abraham's seed. We are the chosen ones. And yet, John the Baptist is here saying, no, 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 that's not a go-to. You can't use that. You can't claim that. This is what you've got. God can raise up stones to become Abraham's seed. So if God can create people from inanimate objects, you can't just go ahead and say, I've got Abraham and all those promises that God gave him, they're mine. You can't say that at all. This is what he says next. Verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In fact, this is a very interesting phrase. This is a very interesting phrase because it re is repeated in the Gospels a few times. And the concept and theme is actually represented throughout scriptures. You see, I can do all the stuff that makes me look like a Christian. I can think the stuff that Christians are supposed to think. But it doesn't mean to say that in my heart I'm a Christian. I can follow Jesus. But if I truly follow Jesus, my life will be changed. Now we see that in the pattern that, that John the Baptist is preaching here. But right now, let's look at this a little bit further. Let's just jump a few pages onwards, a few chapters onwards to Luke chapter 6. And we read verses 43 to 45. 
Okay, Luke chapter 6, 43 to 45. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men don't gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So that's interesting. Okay, this phrase then is even now the axe is laid at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, this fruit issue, this tree issue is important. So let's jump now a few chapters onwards again to chapter 13. Luke chapter 13 verses 6 to 9. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look! For three years I have come seeking fruit of this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that you can cut it down. So this is a significant theme. Jesus refers to this concept a few times. Not only this, we have it in the Gospel of John. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. So let's jump there. Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 15. Here we are. Verses 1 to 8. Jesus says, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is with it. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So those are some direct themes, but there's something in these themes that I want us to pick up on. Even now the axe laid up to the root of the trees. What does that tell you? So right now, something tremendous is happening. This is an important time. So right now, the axe is there at the root of the trees, ready to cut it down. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what did John the Baptist say just moments earlier? He said, therefore, sorry, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. John and Jesus were preaching the same thing. The difference is Jesus is the Messiah. So when Jesus says right now, now is the time, then now is the time. But the Pharisee is hearing here, they're saying, what can we do? They recognize in themselves that, yes, time is very short. The prophesied time is right there at hand. It is at hand, like these books behind me are at hand. See? So let's continue. The people asked, saying, What shall we do then? And he answered them and said, He who has two tunics, let him give one give to have what sorry, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none, and he who has food, let him do likewise. This calls for a personal investment. I cannot know if somebody is hungry unless I actually interact with them. I can see if somebody is starving. But I don't know if they're hungry 
unless I'm sitting next to them and I hear their stomach growl. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were no better, would put themselves in a position where they would not need to interact with people who were deemed as sinners. This means that anybody who appears or I think or assume does not have a good standing spiritually is not worthy of their august time. So what John was telling them was very personal. It's like, you, you see those people over there who are poor? In your mind, you are thinking that they're only poor because they're cursed by God. The health and wealth gospel is not the gospel taught by Jesus. It is not the gospel taught in the scriptures. Because the health and wealth that God gives is not about the good clothes I can wear. And so John says, if you have two tunics, that person over there that you know is a little bit cold and they don't have another tunic, another jacket, give your second one to them. Let them have that blessing. God gives you a blessing so you can give it on. Jesus himself said, freely you have received, freely give. Everything we have is a gift from God. No doubt about that. But what is it given for? And then he says, Likewise, if you have plenty of food, find somebody who's hungry. Feed them. So when you're walking down the street and there's that man in rags that is there, don't turn your nose up. Don't look the other way. But say, hey, look, I'm going down to the shop grabbing myself a pasty. Come along, we'll have it together. Maybe throw in a hot drink as well. Do you see? It requires a change of mind. Fruit worthy of repentance. If I realize that God can raise up children of Abraham from the stones, he can do anything, he is God. Then I realize that God doesn't need me, but rather he wants me. There's a huge difference. Children of Abraham were supposed to be a blessing to the world. And yet, looking down their noses at everybody, they forgot what that gifting was about. John was reminding them but they're fruit worthy of repentance. As they are there, there's another group of people who are, who are uh, listening to John preach. You can imagine John standing there. Just imagine him standing on a rock or a rise and he's calling, speaking so powerfully. And there's the holy people, you know, they're very close. They're the ones who, who jostle forwards and they say, teach us the word. They genuinely desire to know God's word. This is not a bad thing. In fact, it's a very good thing because if they were too proud to actually listen to the word of God, they never would have heard the call to repentance. And then further back, there were those who were listening who weren't allowed to come close. Now, these ones are very interesting. It says in verse 12, then the tax collectors also came to be baptized. I can see the Pharisees and the Sadducees both huddling together. Not a scene you often see, but they say, who are those traitors, collaborators with the enemy coming here? But they are there to hear the word of God also. See, the tax collectors, I... Uh, what can be said about them? The tax collectors were Hebrews, just like them, Jews, but they worked for a foreign government who was deemed to be unworthy. Worse than that, they were extracting payment from their fellow countrymen to give 
to the foreign powers. They were the ones who were seen as, you guys, you're the problem with this country. You're the reason why they prosper while we are ground in the dust under their heavy boot. But they were there to hear the gospel. They were there to hear the good news of salvation, that there was one coming who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That John, as amazing as his preaching was, was not worthy to untie his sandal. And they are there receiving the good news. But don't think that just because I say sorry, that I am sorry. You know that phrase where somebody says something funny or silly and somebody's a little bit uncomfortable about it and then they say, sorry, not sorry. Uh, this is not what we're talking about in the Gospels. See, if you are sorry, you are sorry. Let your yes be yes, your no be no. No mucking around with your words, no wrangling words. But rather, this is what he says to the tax collectors. The tax collectors are convicted. They are there saying, we heard your message and we feel we are a brood of vipers. We feel who is going to save us from this wrath to come. We need this baptism of repentance for the remission of our sins. That God removes our sins. They turn away, turn their back on the sins. See, this is what he says. Teacher, what shall we do? In the end of verse 12 and then verse 13, he says, Collect no more than what is appointed you. You see, the government at that time said, This is the amount that we expect for you to give back to us. You've got this amount of people in your area, in your region. So we expect this much tax from you. But whatever increase you put on it, that's your wage. And we don't care about that. That's your business. Some of them were being very fair. They say, well, this is a reasonable wage. But many of them decided, I have a standard that I need to keep. So just work it up a little bit and then a little bit more. And you can imagine while their wages increase, then their appreciation and ability to move around freely in their society was diminished. But you see the difference between the them and the us mindset that they were struggling with at that time. The tax collectors had this. And John says, you know what, you need to work to survive. You need to work to keep your family healthy, well, and supplied with what they Come need. Come to see a tax collector in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 tells us about one particular tax collector named Zacchaeus. Now, there's a particular little part that shows us and connects us to what John is preaching here. Remember, John tells them, you know, don't take what is not yours. Only take what is reasonable and appointed to you. Don't take extra. Don't extort or exploit your position. Collect no more than what is appointed of you, is what John says. Now we go to, to the uh, chapter 19 of, of the Gospel of Luke, and we say, Zacchaeus, what on earth are you doing? He's gone there, he's climbed a tree, he's, he's not a very tall man, and Jesus stops right under that tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm going to come and have a meal with you. And so Zacchaeus makes haste, as Scripture says, and he hurries up, and he comes down pretty quick. And it says in verse, uh, verse 8, Then Zacchaeus stood up, and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now look at the, the, the tenses and the, the uh, 
time frame that he's given. He says, look, Lord, so pay attention, see, I give. This is present tense. It's past happening now. I did and I'm doing. And the insinuation is he will continue to do, but he states it then. And if I have present tense and past, if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now he's following the word of God. He knows God's word and God has said, if you steal from somebody, you must repay it back fourfold. You have taken from them. That's not on. Give back to them, not just one that you took, not just double. Give them back fourfold. Zacchaeus knew this and the people around him were treating him like dirt. And Zacchaeus was, uh, look, Lord, this is, this is what I believe and this is what I live. And Jesus says to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I am wondering if Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was one of those tax collectors who'd come to be baptized, who heard this, take no more than what is appointed to you. But there's another group of people here. It says, likewise, the soldiers in verse 14, asked him, and what shall we do? Now, soldiers, hang on a second. We almost always default to the Romans. But think about it. The tax collectors were there. One of the things that the local constabulary, I guess we can call them, were appointed to do was to protect and be on security for the tax collectors, especially when they were on business. So these soldiers were likely there on official police business. They were likely there to just suss out and make sure there wasn't any trouble. They were likely there also to, to make sure that the, the tax collectors were not um, set upon. And as we see these, well, hang on, then that's not Romans. These are actually soldiers that belong to Herod Antipas. They are in the employ of the government, the local government. So these are our, our, our local boys in blue. And ladies of blue too. When we see this, hang on. They're not there so much to hear the word. They're there on official business. Some of them may have been there off duty. But they're being convicted as well. John says, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely and be content with your wages. I don't know if it's universal, but it seems that the constabulary police force is often underappreciated and they were subject to funding cuts as well. They don't have an easy job, but at the same time, it's nevertheless an important one. Now, these people who commit their lives to service are being convicted by the Holy Spirit that they themselves, they want to be saved too. They want to be right with God. And John says, well, what repentance looks for, for you guys, you know what everybody's saying about you. You've heard the stories. We've heard the news. We've read the newspapers. We've watched those YouTube clips too much. So John says, don't falsely accuse anybody. Don't whinge about your wage. You're serving God, basically. You're there for a very important purpose, but don't intimidate anybody. Don't treat anybody poorly just because of your position. Don't try and push people over the line. 
I remember I had just got my license. I went from my L's to my P's. It was the first solo driving expedition that I was doing. I was going from, from um, the central coast in New South Wales up to, to Newcastle. And as I was going up there, I, mind you, I was in a little Ford Laser, I think a late 80s Ford Laser. So a little car and I was driving there. I was keeping to my speed limit. I didn't want to go fast because I'd only just got my license and I was <laughs> that little bit of freedom. And then this big troopy pulls up behind me and goes so very close behind me. The thing is, oh, it had some sirens on the top that weren't going at the time. And it pulled up and I was driving up the freeway and I was nervous like anything else. And I didn't know what to do. I was, I was worried that I was going to have an accident because I was that nervous. But this troop carrier was right behind me. This big, big old Land Cruiser there. Oh, I was intimidated like nothing else. And I was so relieved when they pulled away from behind me and kept driving on and did the same to somebody else. John says, no, 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 that's a no-no. And I, I, indeed, I know for sure that amongst the constabulary, that was also a no-no. But occasionally these things happen. So John is telling, what does repentance look like? You treat everybody with respect. Don't worry about your uniform. Don't worry about your position. You treat people with respect. In most cases, respect will be returned. And that goes two ways. That's for everybody. So John is giving us this information. And it's not just stuff that goes in my head. What does it mean to us right now in this era? What are we seeing around us that requires justice? What are we seeing around us that deviates from God's word? And where do we have opportunities just like the Pharisees? If we have two tunics and enough food for two people. Where do we have an opportunity to share? Same thing with the tax collectors. Do we take advantage of people's poverty by trying to wrangle down a price on somebody trying to sell something on buy, swap and sell to be able to meet a bill? We don't know them well enough to know their situation. We just see it there. Oh, that's a great bargain. Let's see if I can haggle it down. Or even at the, the thrift shops, I, I uh, see oftentimes at Waila Adra, then somebody occasionally will come in and try and make an already rock bottom price just that much less. The thing is, these are donations for the benefit of the community, to give back to the community. So why would I, who is blessed by God, I might not be blessed by wealth, but I am blessed by God, try and take away from somebody else who is in need? tax collector's message says don't do that you're blessed by God share that blessing on and then the soldier's message is respect those around you don't intimidate anybody by your position don't look down on anybody and accept your wages now let's go back to the beginning that I was sharing about what they are expecting they're waiting for the Messiah, Jesus. He's about to be ordained for those three and a half years that had been prophesied. And he's there. He's right there with them, just about to begin his ministry. And these people are preparing for Emmanuel, for God with us. Are we not also waiting for Jesus to return? The Apostle Peter says something in chapter 3 of Second Peter and verse 11, 2 Peter 3, verse 11, he says this. You can read it with me. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11. Oh, I went to 1 Peter. 2 Peter 3, verse 11 tells us, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, 
What manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conduct and godliness? People are looking for a saviour. And aren't we called to be ambassadors? Just like John. But the thing is, he's not preaching to the Romans or the Gentiles, brood of vipers who warned you to escape the coming wrath. He's preaching to us, the church. What manner of persons ought we be in holy conduct and godliness? Indeed, if we, if we turn over just back a few pages to 1 Peter chapter 4, we are waiting for the second coming. We are eagerly anticipating. We are watching the signs closely. We see the birth pangs that Jesus spoke about happening with increasing rapidity. And this should be exciting for us. But at the same time, it means we got to get active and get ready to be able to share with those who are looking for salvation. Proclaim that message that God has given us for this time. Flee from confusion. Embrace Jesus as the truth. It says in verse 7 of chapter 4 of 1 Peter, so that's 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 7, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know, don't just muck around. This is serious. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, as each one has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability with which God gives, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Why do we do it? Because we want Jesus not to keep to ourselves, but to share with others. And if I am being selfish or proud, following human nature, then I am not following Jesus. You see, Jesus has given his all for us. How can we not give it back? To share it out. Out of his abundance. The grace which he has supplied you, we can share with others around us. Do you hope in the second coming of Jesus? Are you waiting eagerly for that time that has been prophesied? Are you watching those signs? This message that John the Baptist preached, the repentance and remission of sins. We have Jesus. Don't you want others to have Jesus too? I'm pretty certain that your answer is yes. And praise the Lord for that. But remember the message of Elijah. Remember that message. Repent. John the Baptist makes straight his paths. Are we making straight the paths of the Lord? I sincerely hope and pray so. Pray with me now. Our Father in heaven, we, we have heard this message of repentance. We have, have seen that there are some similarities that are unmistakable between John the Baptist's preaching, his era, his day, waiting for Jesus to come. With ours, we also see the signs that Jesus has foretold. And the prophecies are being fulfilled. So we'd like to ask you humbly to teach us to be the John the Baptists with the message you've given us for this day, this age, right now. May we stir one another up to good works. Lord, may we hear your Holy Spirit preaching. And as the prophet said, 
ye brood of vipers, who warned you to avoid, to run away from the wrath to come? May we hear the Holy Spirit's word saying to us, we need you, Lord. Repent, turn away from the sins, from the wrath, but turn to your love and grace and share it as you have freely given. May we also freely give. So Lord, make us to be what you have called us to be. In Jesus' most wonderful holy name we pray. Amen. Blessings all.